Hello, everyone. And this one is another in the Mesa series. Uh, we've already done ones on PG Star on, on how to install Mesa. And this one uh, is going to be on best practices. And I'm super happy to have Mateo here with us today. Hi, Mateo. Hi, Frank. Hello, everyone. What's your, what's your geolocation these days, Mateo? I'm currently in Brooklyn. Um, and yeah, enjoying the New York winter. Awesome. Awesome. And I'm in Phoenix. Uh, believe it or not, is actually relatively cool for Phoenix, and it is wet today. So we're actually getting what Phoenix calls winter. <laughs> All great. Super. Um, so let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, we've got some, some uh, about nine slides here, and Mateo's going to guide us through on this checklist and best practices. Take it away. Yeah, thanks, Frank. I mean, this is just a very quick uh, checklist and introduction to some best practices uh, for people who have uh, done work with Mesa and want to publish the results. And we're not going to tell you uh, how to publish, but we're going to tell you how to deal with the, the part that <laughs> that uh, you know handle uh, reproducibility uh, for the Mesa results, which I think it's a it's an important part uh, of the workflow and something that Mesa allows pretty well. And that's a lovely paper. I believe that's from Aaron Polarans there on electron. Yeah. From close yeah. machinery systems. Good example. I was, uh, yeah, Aaron, actually, it's an old friend of mine. We haven't seen each other in a long time, but we were in the same institute when I was doing my PhD. Oh, I, was, yeah. I was looking for a paper to put there, and I, I saw his name. I was like, yeah, that will work. Yeah, he's in, uh, I believe he's in Illinois now. Mm -hmm. And he's been using Mesa, so. Yep. Cool, so um, yeah, this is a, a, a brief checklist that I, um, I jot down. Um, it's pretty much, you know, after you describe your Mesa setup in your paper, something you wanna do is including standard references and I'll, I'll mention what those are and, and then do things like check naming conventions for, um, for Mesa and then sharing your in list and your extension. This last part is going to be the most important part, and we'll get to that uh, in a second. Uh, but first, uh, you know, as you know, there are a number, a growing number of Mesa instrument papers, and there are five at, at this time. And I think it's, uh, it's uh, um, useful for the reader to know about them so that he can uh, access the deep secrets of Mesa. And uh, um, we actually created a little ADS uh, library that you can, uh, it's linked on this PDF and you can use to download directly your BibTeX. So it can be very easy to include in your publication. Um, another thing, thing that I think it's important uh, is acknowledging some of the microphysics that is uh, adopted uh, in Mesa. Depends a little bit on what's the angle of your paper, but I think in general, uh, sometimes it's hard to include uh, in the main text all the details of uh, all the processes and how their uh, implementation has been accounted for in Mesa. And so some of these processes can be added in an appendix, like it's done here. This is not the only way to do it, but you can see that there's an acknowledgement outside of the base, uh, Mesa uh, version used to, for example, um, the opacity, the equation of state, nuclear reaction, uh, screening factors, and so on and so forth. Um, it's, I think it's great to give, a, to give an acknowledgement to the people that work very hard to come up with these prescriptions. Um, as I said, this is not the only way to do it. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just add in here a little bit. Um, it's kind of, there's, there's a certain analogy uh, mm -hmm. when people are writing their papers that they will tend to cite a review article, an ARA article. Um, and that's great, it's wonderful, uh, but that usually that ARA article is built on a lot of um, hard work by many people. And so um, it can be useful to cite, in addition to the ARA, uh, some of the key papers that are mentioned in the ARA that help your work. And, and this list is not complete. For example, if you're doing diffusion, um, there's some standard diffusion references to, to, uh, uh, to deploy if you're doing rotation. Um, radiative levitation, a number of them. So I wouldn't take this, this microphysics list as complete. It's, it's a common example, just about everybody runs an equation state or an opacity, 
but there are other particular parts that if you're using them and they're you know important to what you're doing for the paper um you should mention them yeah i agree and and uh, as you said this is just an example and of course depending on the focus of the of your paper i think it's important to uh, mentioned some of these things directly in the main text with respect to an appendix, depending exactly how important they are, how, how, how crucial your choice is for the results. Um, in this case, for example, some of this microphysics is probably not crucial for the result of the paper in question, but uh, we felt like, this is a paper I wrote with Adam, uh, we felt like it was important to acknowledge anyway, and we put it into an appendix. Okay. Um, yeah, and I mean, obviously, the other things I think it's fair to do is acknowledge all software that someone is using uh, for uh, getting your results. And, you know, Mesa is not the only software that people use when they uh, come up with their plots and uh, the results. You know, there are a lot of tools. And again, this is an example of some of the tools that might some someone might have used for writing and uh, the paper or coming up with the results and their, and their, um, and their plots. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's great here. You can see the Mesa SDK from Rich. Uh, there are many other examples. One, one that comes to mind is, for example, Mist. Uh, a lot of people use the isochrons, so it's good to um, also um, give, a, give a good acknowledgement to that piece of software. Gyre would be another one, for example. A lot of Yeah, Gyre would be another one, so exactly. Gyre in your, in your slash software, uh, part of your article. Yeah, and I believe now uh, some, yeah, some publications like uh, the APJ allows you to, to, uh, to have like a specific part of the of the text where you uh, you refer to these tools. Right, and um, the reason you want to put it in slash software as opposed to just citing it within the article is this is how NASA ADS picks up and tabulates citations to software. Ah, okay. Just the paper. So it's really specifically to help ADS properly acknowledge software usage. So okay, as, that's great. I did. So this is particular to the AAS journals. I think it's a great, great addition. It's come up in the last few years. But we, you know, recognize um, sometimes people publish in other journals <laughs> who by me will go unmentioned. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, and they don't have a slash software, but nevertheless, you can take it upon yourself, maybe not to have a you know italic software, but to um, call out the site the software that is that is cited in those other journals. So yeah, thanks. I actually I didn't know about that uh, distinction for the metadata uh, that uh, APJ does. Right. Okay, if you, cool. just, you put it in a software, if you put it, oh, excuse me, if you put it like in a footnote, right, it's like you've got something on GitHub and you put it in a footnote, ADS doesn't pick that up as, as a citation to that software. So if you're really looking to help the authors of that software project, you really want to put it into slash software section. Great. Um, Okay, finally, the last part, which I think it's, uh, it's very relevant, is the issue of re reproducibility. I think it's a very desirable uh, part of any scientific uh, research workflow. Um, and I'll make it the argument that this is absolutely not just for the reader, but it's also for the person who's doing the research. And uh, I speak from experience. I think, you know, I only started adopting this type of workflow in recent times. and um, and it proved to be extremely valuable to be able to reproduce your own results, uh, you know, down the line. Um, it, 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 it's very hard for me, for example, when people ask me about papers I wrote maybe 10 years ago to <laughs> be able to dig out the code and the data, it, it's nope. almost impossible. Uh, the hope here is that if one shares the list, shares the Runstar Extras, F90, all the extension, and even if possible, shared data and code, uh, it's really possible to go back and try to redo what you did and maybe continue that piece of, of research. Imagine uh, you wrote the paper five years ago and uh, now there is the new findings that maybe changes the, the, the place in the parameter space where you want to start your uh, simulation, your calculation from. So you want to redo that, that, that work uh, you can either start from scratch or you can go back, take those uh, 
um, took the repository and 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 redo the the work and that can be very very fast if you had documented and and shared everything uh, well so um, an example I think there's this uh, recent paper from Josiah I mean it's again it's one I took from someone I knew but there's so many uh, so many examples on the web um, where he added a, a footnote and saying that input and output files for the research he described, and this is a paper he published this year, is available on Zenodo. And Zenodo is a, an interesting repository in the sense because it also provides a DOI. And the, the advantage of having a digital object identifier is that people can actually cite directly that piece of code or that piece of software or that repository. So if someone is using your data or your piece of software, whatever you uh, encapsulated into that repository, uh, they might, you know, be able to actually give the proper uh, acknowledgement using the DOI, so citing that that little piece of uh, of content. So I think that's a, that's a good way to go about it. So I have two comments then, um, and I fully agree with you about um, it helps you remember your own stuff, um, but it's also useful for other people building upon your stuff. You know, standing on absolutely science. So. For example, I have recently picking up, picked up uh, a Zenodo repo from a user, um, Rob Farmer, and I'm using those inlets and those run star extras for a piece of science to extend uh, what Rob had already done on this. So um, it's good, you know, to help build the community. Everybody doesn't need to reinvent the wheel for themselves. You can build on what other people are doing, and it's a it's a great way to build provenance in the community. And on Zenodo, Mesa does have its own Zenodo area. You don't have to you know, create your own Zenodo area. In fact, it's often better if you put it in the Mesa Zenodo so that everything is um, easily locatable. Um, and yeah, we'll put that up. Sorry, that's all I yeah. want. So. Yeah, thanks, Frank. I mean, you're totally right. In fact, the, the, the idea of reproducibility is exactly for what you said. And that's the main case. Um, I, I, I wanted to mention the more personal use because sometimes it's it's hard to justify all the extra work when you get to publish. But if you think about also personal return, I think it makes it a little bit more uh, easy on yourself and, and it motivates you to to go about it. Um, and, and as I said, I speak from personal experience with that. Yeah, um, yeah so yeah, this is pretty much what I wanted to say. Um, I think that um, oh, the other thing actually we wanted to discuss yeah. is naming conventions. Um, this is a very short reminder that um, Mesa is a piece of code, but is ultimately a software instrument. So it'll allow um, to run um, some calculations. In this case, our experiments in stellar astrophysics. Um, it's uh, modular and open source. And it's made of these independent modules for both physics and numerical algorithms. These are like actually, um, uh, if you go in your Meta folder, you will see there are directories that um, contain independent modules that can be used independently actually for calculating opacity, equation of state, or even solving uh, some linear algebra. Um, so it's, uh, it's, uh, that's, that's the beauty of this uh, collection of modules the ability to use them independently if you want and connect it to even other softwares, uh, software interest, instruments. Um, the piece of, of, of Mesa that everybody knows at some level is the inlist, which is you know the main control room for Mesa. It's the file containing the configuration. Uh, so this is definitely something you wanna uh, share and add to your repository when you publish because that's really uh, the core together with the Mesa version to the minimum required to run an experiment. Um, most of the time people will also extend Mesa and this is a made possible without by Mesa um, via the Runstar Extra F90 file, which actually allows user to not have to dig into the main code, modify the main code, and uh, you can still access the deep interior of Mesa uh, thanks to these hooks provided via the other underscore something subroutines. And these uh, are subroutines that you can use in your Runster Extras to access different part 
of the inner guts of Mesa and change uh, variables at runtime and do all sorts of extra experiments using your favorite physic of choice. And um, yeah, so if you have done that, there's something else you want to share. You run star extras.f90 because that's going to be a, a key uh, part to um, to allow reproducibility. And that's really everything. I'll just give an example there. So what role, okay. you know, one that people, you may come up with a new mass loss prescription of something and you don't have to wait for the Mesa developers to put this uh, mass loss formula inside Mesa. Um, and in fact, in the future, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm going to push people to do uh, use their run star extras, use their other hooks. And so without ever touching the core of Mesa, as Mesa mentioned, you can put in your own mass loss formula and uh, Mesa will pick it up through this use of uh, the other subroutines um, in your run star extras. So it's a, it's a very powerful capability of uh, being able to add on your favorite physics without ever touching the core. Yeah. Um, cool. Um, I just want to leave with this uh, slide that contains uh, links to resources that can be useful. Just like uh, these are like the kind of official Mesa resources, the homepage where you can download Mesa uh, and, you know, get started. The Mesa Marketplace, which is a place where people uh, uh, can... Uh, Aggregate. It's an aggregation site of yeah. resources. Right. So there's actually people put in list there put piece of software, it's a little bit of a, of a nice, really, marketplace for all Mesa Saints. Um, and then there's a new Mesa documentation, which is growing and very, very useful. Um, and finally, links to the instrument papers link and to this very uh, YouTube channel for these tutorials. Here we are. Awesome. That was great. <laughs> that was really great. Uh... We may want to put up the PDF for this somewhere too. I can link to it in the description down below the video uh, and we'll see if we can put this uh, perhaps on Zenodo. That would a great place to put that. <laughs> so let's go ahead and do that. Let's okay. get on Zenodo, the PDF, and we'll link to it um, as an example of how to get to the, uh, the Mesa Zenodo. Awesome. All right, thank you so much, Mateo. You're very welcome. Thank you, Frank. <laughs>